and thank you for joining us for this installment of the California Employment News, an informative video resource offered by the Labor and Employment Group at Weintraub Tobin. My name is Katie Collins, and I'm an associate in the Labor and Employment Group, and I am joined today by partner Megan Baybridge. Today, we will be discussing new legislation signed into law by Governor Newsom at the end of September that will require employee handbooks to be updated. Megan, why don't you start us off with the first bill of importance? Thanks, Katie. Well, first up is AB 1041, which expands the definition of a family member under the California Family Rights Act. Specifically, it expands the class of people for whom an employee may take leave to care for to include a designated person. Under the law, a designated person is defined as any individual related by blood or whose association with the employee is the equivalent of a family relationship. This person can be identified at any time the employee requests a leave but limits an employee to one designated person per 12 month period. This designated person definition is also being added to the California paid sick leave law. The new law similarly allows a designated person to be identified at the time the employee requests paid sick days, but limits an employee to one designated person per 12 month period of paid sick days. Katie, what other new laws will affect California handbooks in 2023? Thanks, Megan. AB 1949 amends government code sections 12945.21 and 19859.3 and adds government code section 12945.7 relating to bereavement leave. Effective January 1st, 2023, employers with five or more employees must provide employees who have been employed at least 30 days with five days of bereavement leave for the death of a family member. A family member is defined as including a spouse, a domestic partner, a child, a parent, a parent-in-law, a sibling, a grandparent, and a grandchild. The bereavement leave does not need to be taken consecutively, but must be completed within three months of the date of the death of the family member. The employee, if requested by the employer, within 30 days of the first day of the leave, shall provide documentation of the death of the family member. Documentation includes, but is not limited to, a death certificate, a published obituary, or written verification of death, burial, or memorial services from a mortuary, funeral home, burial society, crematorium, religious institution, or governmental agency. Employers are required to maintain the confidentiality of any employees requesting bereavement leave, but may disclose as needed to internal personnel, such as a supervisor or HR, or to legal counsel. Bereavement leave is unpaid generally unless the employer has an existing policy that provides for paid leave, or if the employee has accrued leave, including vacation time or sick leave that they elect to use. If an existing leave policy provides for less than five days of paid bereavement leave, the employee shall be entitled to no less than a total of five days of bereavement leave, consisting of the number of days of paid leave under the existing policy, and the remainder of days of leave may un be unpaid except that an employee may use vacation, personal leave, accrued and available sick leave, or compensatory time off that is otherwise available to the employee. Well, we have now talked about two bills that will definitely require employee handbooks to be updated before the new year. Megan, is there anything else that will cause a need for revisions? Yeah, we haven't discussed SB 1044 yet, which prohibits an employer from taking or threatening adverse action against any employee for refusing to report to or leaving a workplace or worksite within the affected area because the employee has a reasonable belief that workplace or worksite is unsafe due to, due to an emergency condition. Employers can further not prevent employees from using their cell phone during that emergency condition. Reasonable belief is defined as meaning a reasonable person under the circumstances known to the employee at the time would conclude that there's a real danger of death or serious injury if that person enters or remains on the premises. And then an emergency condition is defined as the existence of conditions of a disaster or emergency peril uh, to the safety of persons or property at the workplace caused by either a natural disaster or a criminal act. It can also be in order to evacuate a workplace or work site um, or a worker's home or a school of a worker's child due to a national disaster or a criminal act. Notably, emergency condition does not include a health pandemic. 
In light of these changes, we recommend that employers update their handbooks now and have them ready to put in place on January 1st, 2023. Employers should also ensure all human resources personnel, managers, and supervisors are sufficiently trained to implement these new laws at the beginning of the year. Remember, well-trained supervisors are an employer's first line of defense. Thanks, Megan. That does it for today. Thank you for joining us. You can continue to find California employment news by visiting our blog at www.thelawblog.com and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. We'll see you next time.